Ah, it's a beautiful sunny day. People sat on the beach eating ice creams, making sandcastles. But if you were here sometime in the late 1930s to early 1940s, you'd be on fire. If I was Tom Scott, I'd now be walking up the beach looking into the camera explaining to you how this is not just any ordinary beach, but at one time it was possibly the most important beach in the United Kingdom. But I don't own a red t-shirt, so I'm, I'm not. Welcome to Porth Curnow in Cornwall. A very nice beach that hides quite an important little secret. But to artificially create some dramatic tension, I'm going to leave this there on this tiny little cliffhanger and point out that this video has a sponsor, PCB Way. I mean, heck, I've already mentioned Tom Scott, so I may as well mention Perry Fractic as well. PCB Way, unsurprisingly, is a manufacturer of, wait for it, PCBs. Yep, send them your design and they return you PCBs in the post. They even offer CNCing and 3D printing services as well. Right, now back to our main story. The reason this beach is so important, and the reason that a retro technology channel is covering it and not wish you were here, is this beach was the center of the world's first global telecommunications network. This is where some of the very first telegraph cables that went from one country to another landed. Now, one of the reasons they chose Porthcur now is that the beach nice and gently slopes into the sea, rather than having some sort of a dramatic cliff at some point, which, if you're going to lay a cable, is pretty important. It's also on a fairly handy location on the British coastline as well. The first cable was landed on the beach in 1870 and connected the British mainland to India, and thus created the world's first telegraph service running between Britain and India. Now, for those of you not familiar with telegraph services, and most of us aren't these days because they haven't been around for quite a while now, telegraph services used Morse code, a system that uses a series of either long or short pulses to indicate a particular letter. Later developments in telegraph would ditch the short and long pulse and go for reversing the polarity to indicate either the dot or the dash from Morse code. As that system over longer cables, it was easier to detect the change in the current compared to delineating the short or long pulses. It also meant you could send more characters per second. Initially, most telegraph systems were all manually keyed, using essentially a hand key that kind of looks like this, with an operator either listening or watching a flashing bulb at the other end. Of course, as time got on, this technology got somewhat more sophisticated, and we ended up with automatic senders and recorders. The senders would either relay the message from another telegraph source, or would play one out that was pre-recorded on paper. The recorders would, as you would imagine, record the messages down on paper, which an expert could very quickly decode back into the text. But one constant throughout all of this development was that we needed cables, cables to link the various stations together. And this is why Porth Kerno became so key. After the first cable that was landed in India, many, many, many other cables soon got landed in Porth Kerno. To the point where a very significant proportion of the UK's international telegraph traffic was all routed through Kerno. Of course, if you ever had to refer to the station in Porth Kerno, you weren't going to type that all out the long way via Morse code, so it's got its own little abbreviation, PK. Of course, the really observant amongst you will have noticed a small problem with the initials PK used to represent Porth Kerno, in that Kerno begins with a C. So I guess it should really be PC, but it's not, it's, it's PK. By the beginning of the 1900s, PK had become a really important centre for telecommunications. Not only did it have many international cables landing here, it also had a cable linking it to the rest of the UK, so motorbike messengers were no longer needed to transfer around the messages. By the outbreak of the First World War, military services had all worked out just how important telecommunications were, particularly the telegraph. For example, one of the first Navy actions the UK took when it entered the First World War was to cut German undersea cables, taking out their telegraph system. They also, of course, realised the importance of Porth Kerno, and thus stationed a number of men there to defend it, in case the Germans attempt to storm the station via the beach. As the war progressed, there was very little chance of the Germans actually storming Port Kerno and Cornwall, so not much else needed to be done in order to protect the station. During the interwar years, the volume of telegraph traffic through Kerno increased quite substantially, and Porth Kerno itself had become a training centre for telegraph engineers as well, meaning that by the time the Second World War happened, Porth Kerno was vital to the British war effort, and this meant they were going to step up the defences, and they were going to step up the defences quite a lot. Yeah, this is where the flamethrowers come in. Yes, during this period, this would have been one of the most hazardous beaches to attempt to build a sandcastle on. I mean, first of all, they erected this amount of wooden scaffolding to stretch the full length of the beach, to make it harder to get on the beach, and then they buried in the beach itself a lot of flamethrowers. Amazingly, we actually have some footage of this thanks to the Imperial War Museum, so I'm going to put this here so you can see it. As you can see, this is not an easy beach to walk up at this point in time. 
no amount of Factor 50 is going to get you through this. Of course, being attacked and invaded by the sea isn't the only thing they had to worry about. They had to worry about being attacked from the air. Porthka now had a new security concern on its doorstep, and it's the reason most people actually come to visit the place these days – the Minnick Theatre. Yes, almost anyone who comes to Port Kerno as a holidaymaker comes here either to go on the beach or to see the Minnick Theatre. Very few people actually know the Telegraph Station is here. In fact, the first time I came, I spotted it in the car park of all places and thought, ooh, that looks interesting, I might Google that later to see what it is. After having gone home and Googled it, I was really disappointed to have not actually explored the museum, so this time I rectified that. Now you might be wondering why the Minnick Theatre was such a security concern. Well, it's a big open air theatre that was created by some woman and her gardener to put on Shakespeare plays. And the thing about a big open air amphitheatre is it is inordinately visible from the air, parked out on a cliff top like it is. And if you happen to be a pilot for the Luftwaffe looking for a cable station to bomb, that's a pretty good signpost. Now, dynamiting the theatre off the edge of the cliff into the sea probably also would have been quite obvious because there would have been a big dynamited rock, so Kerno had to take air defence pretty seriously, and for that they were going to build themselves some bomb shelters. And if you come here today, this is the majority of what you'll see. Yes, these two caves were essentially blasted out into the cliff face and was used to house the station's equipment and personnel. Now you can see I'm walking along this entrance tunnel here, and of course nature has taken a very small corner of it back there. And as we go through the massive bomb blast doors, you can see your way inside. And today it's used to show an array of equipment that was used at the time and before that period, and is extremely atmospheric. The construction of the bomb shelters is essentially two tunnels blasted out into the rock with a number of interconnecting tunnels, as you can see in this diagram. Also at the far end, furthest away from the entrance tunnels, you'll see there's a vertical shaft that goes up, which is the emergency exit out onto the cliffs above. We couldn't go up there that day because, yes, nature had reclaimed it as a nesting site. If you come to visit the museum, these tunnels are essentially one of the biggest parts of the display. There's also a building as well, which houses this particularly nice cafe that does really good cakes. And yes, I did try some of the cakes, let's say for research. Now, despite the fact that Kerno was quite an obvious target for the Germans during the Second World War, it wasn't actually ever directly attacked. No sea invasions were launched, unsurprisingly. And the Luftwaffe, they assumed attempted to bomb it, a couple of local farmers' fields took a hit, the nearest one being about one mile away. In fact, you can see this giant bomb that was diffused that hit that farm. It's alright, no one was injured. Now, we should probably go over how this all would plumb together. So, we'll start with the beach hut. This is where the cables actually landed, so they come in along the beach and they terminate in this hut here, which is still open today and you can still have a little look inside. This is right at the top of the beach. And as we can see, there are a number of cables here. The cables then head up from this hut, up the cable walk. We can see a bit of that has survived, with some of these wooden structures left. And then eventually they're fed into the bunker, and you can see one of the sort of termination points in the bunker here as well as running day-to-day -day operations from Porth Kernow. It was also used as a training college and a centre for doing diagnostics as well. Now you might wonder, what are they going to diagnose? It's just a cable. Well, it was not too uncommon for the cables to get broken. Things like ship's anchors would drag across them and snap the cable, or they'd just get damaged from movement on the seabed. Now if you see this hoofing great big piece of equipment here, this is one of the key tools to help them to find where a break in the cable might be. Essentially, this is measuring the resistance across the core of the cable. Because they know roughly how many ohms equals how many miles of cabling, they can use this to find out where the break in the cable is. A ship could then be dispatched to that point on the cable, and they essentially did fish up both ends using things like this cable capture device here, which they just drag along the seabed, essentially sailing at a right angle to the cable until they've fished up one of the ends. They bring that up on deck, they do the same to fish up the other end, and essentially they splice a new chunk of cable in. The version here is the more modern version of this. There's a much more old-fashioned version here in the other part of the museum. Now all of this site became owned by Cable and Wireless, and that's the reason why on this site is the Cable and Wireless archive, which unfortunately we, that wasn't open and we didn't have permission to go film in, but I'm hoping to go back there at some point in time. By 1950, Porth Kerno took on a new role. Not only was it still a cable landing station and Telegraph was still operational, it became the training college for Cable and Wireless, known as the Cable and Wireless Engineering School. Now, 
It wasn't just engineers from the UK that were trained here, it was engineers from across the entire of cable and wireless's operations. Initially it started life as just a college for men, but soon they added a women's dormitory, and then it was teaching women engineers as well. The engineers being trained at the college were not just there to be trained about telegraphy, they were indeed being trained in a whole variety of telecommunications technologies, which put Porf Kernow at the forefront of satellite communications in the early days. In fact, the first major satellite uplink and downlink station in the UK, Goonhilly, is also based in Cornwall, only about an hour's drive away from Porf Kernow. And that site selection was not by accident. However, as time wore on, telegraph became less and less of a relevant technology, so the number of staff needed to operate Porf Kernow as a as a telegraph station, dropped off. It's not like the need to land cables changed, in fact there are still a number of fibre optics that land at Porthkerno to this day, but there was less need for engineering works to actually take place on site. This meant that the decision to keep the engineering school near where the engineering was being done seemed to become less and less relevant over time. By the early 1990s the decision was taken to close the engineering school. A big factor of this being the fact that there wasn't much engineering work directly happening at Porthkerno itself anymore, but also Porthkerno is not the most accessible place in the world. I mean, you should see the roads approaching this place, they're basically one car wide, with a non-trivial percentage of the locals choosing to treat every bend at 90 miles an hour, Why a terrified caravan owner comes the other way. Also, the UK has a long history of not investing money in Cornwall which is why you'll find it doesn't have a motorway. Every other bit of the UK has a motorway, but apparently no one thought it was a good idea to put one in Cornwall. You can see why the Cornish might get a tiny bit bitter. So the difficulty of accessing the site, coupled with the lack of engineering work actually occurring at the site, meant the decision was taken for the college to close. Fortunately, it did occur to people that you might want to preserve the legacy of such a place. Which is why things like the World War II bunkers are still surprisingly accessible and not damp, because they were never left to fall into rack and ruin. And the Puff Kerno site was reborn as a museum and also the Cable and Wireless Archive. It's a shame the museum doesn't get as much attention as perhaps it deserves. Part of this is probably because it has a world famous open air theatre on its doorstep regularly performing plays, and a really really nice beach, so lots of people come here, but they're coming here for those two things, and it's hard to be a third thing that gets a look in. But if you are ever on holiday in Cornwall and fancy checking this place out, I would, and then you can take the kids to the beach afterwards, I mean that's what I did. Also, you know, there's a nice cafe. Those cakes really are quite good. Now before we finish this video, I do want to show you some of the bits of equipment they had here. Because some of this telegraphy equipment looks incredible. I mean, it's built at a period before we have um, proper electronics, I mean we don't have any transistors or microchips or anything, valves at best. But what they were able to achieve before that technology came into existence is incredible. I mean a mixture of this stuff is electromechanical systems with a surprising amount of clockwork in them in some cases. But there's just an incredible quantity of polished brass if nothing else to know that. We also have this example of a five needle telegraph created by Charles Wheatstone. Yes, the man famous for the Wheatstone Bridge. Which is not actually a bridge, more of an electrical circuit. Also, if you're a folk musician that likes concertinas, the bloke famous for making concertinas. He had a surprising number of strings to his bow, did that fella. Of course, Charles Wheatstone was not the only famous physicist at the time getting involved in the world of telegraphy. Oh no. Yes, Faraday was also involved. In fact, being one of the most significant and novel technologies of the day, a surprising number of well-known names are involved in the world of telegraphy. For a telecommunications technology, telegraph had a surprisingly long life, particularly compared to any technology created in the last, say, 30-40 years. The last vestige of any service related to telegrams in the UK shut down in 2003, when BT closed down the service that essentially replaced the telegram, where instead of a messenger delivering your telegram, you'd get phoned up and a machine voice would read it out to you. But the influence of the telegram system is, well, felt everywhere. Our modern ways of representing text in computers, ASCII, that's based around some of the character encoding ideas used for late telegraph systems. And of course the method used to take a message that was delivered by a telegraph to someone's house, a telegram, well that's still the name for a number of services available today. If you got all the way to the end of this video I'd like to say thank you very much for watching. And of course if you like this video, well YouTube's created the mechanism for you to inform it of such, which is the little like button below. And if you really, really enjoyed the video, please hit that subscribe button because 
That makes a huge difference to how much YouTube can be bothered telling other people that this video exists.